we, we, were, we were working our way through the Siddha, right, in the, just the morning services, working out what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do. And uh, we, got, we got to page 118, which is a lot, the last paragraph in the Shema. So um, unfortunately for those of you that have just joined now, um, we really, really got to the, the, really the very end over here, got to the, la the last phrase, the last verse, um, in this final paragraph where we say, So the last, if I remember correctly, the last thing that we spoke about that, had to, that was to do with the Amida itself was the names, right? Adding in your name, um, right? Yeah. When I look up my name, I have two names. Do you look up? Both just names? a just a name that you're known by. Both 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 have. Uh, uh, what what's your name? The end says Moshe Gedalia, so they both end up in him. Yeah, I just just stick with Moshe. Whatever whatever you're known by, that that's. Uh, well, people usually don't use the second name, right? Not not that I know of. If you want, for sure you can. Yeah. I mean, that's not. Uh, I don't I don't think when you get upstairs, the age of 120. If the only thing that God can pin on you is that you use two verses to remember both your names, then I think you're doing. I think you're doing okay. But uh, in general, you know, whatever. The uh, so we, the, the names we're not going to go through that all over again. But there's a there's a couple of pages which have your your Hebrew name, the beginning the beginning letter, and the last letter corresponds to a verse, and that way it sort of helps you remember who you are. Um, looking around the room is maybe uh, you know maybe it's not such an important thing to do. I don't know, but. Uh, that, that, and then what do we do? We, we take three steps backwards. Now, why are we taking three steps backwards over here? Because we're taking leave. The, the, um, the divine presence has been in, in front of us as we've been praying the Amidas. We've been praying the Shemona And uh, we're now taking leave of the divine presence. So you take three steps backwards. I don't know if you remember this stuff, but at the beginning of the Amidah, you took three steps forwards. Right? So now you're taking three steps back as if you're at the beginning, you're walking into the domain of the divine presence. And now you're walking, you're, you're taking leave. Um, and then you bow once to the left, once to the right and once to the middle. Now, why are we bowing to the left first? You know, everything in Judaism is very, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very exact religion, except perhaps for timekeeping. But that's, uh, that's something else, right? But... Uh, it's, a, it's a, very, a very exact religion, and it's interesting that under normal circumstances, we normally give precedence to the right-hand side. Right? The right hand is considered to be the stronger side. Uh, the right hand, again, in Kabbalistic terms, it's interesting that the right is always uh, analogous to the side of mercy, God's mercy, and the left side is considered to be the, the dimension of what's called din, of judgment. Um, and we spoke about it the other week. We spoke about this idea that... Uh, you would have thought it would be the other way around. You would have thought that your stronger side would be the, the side of judgment. But in fact, what we're being taught is you should utilize the stronger dimension of you for mercy and the weaker part of you for judgment, because that way it's, you're going to be an easier, it's going to be easier to be around you, right? It's, you're going to be more compassionate for the people that are around you. So we bow to the left. Why are we bowing to the left? So the answer, of course, is quite simple, because God, the divine presence, is facing us. Therefore, our left aligns to the Divine Presence right. So when we bow to the left first, we're bowing to God's right, and then we bow to the right, and we're bowing to God's left, and then we bow to the middle. And as we're doing that, we're supposed to be saying the little phrase over here, Oisei Shalom Bim Romov. So we, when you say Oisei Shalom Bim Romov, you bow to the left, right? May the expressions of uh, what's it gone? He who makes peace in his height. Hu ya se Shalom Elenu, then you bow to the right. He should make peace upon us, for I'll call Yisrael and on the whole of Israel, Amen. Which is at the final, the final verse inside of this final paragraph of the Amida is revolving around the concept of shalom, of peace. Um, it's interesting that the final Mishnah in the whole of the, what are called the Shishay Sidra Mishnah, the whole of the orders of the Mishnah, the final Mishnah also deals with the concept of peace. That, uh, that uh, God wants to give us the Torah, the Torah is going to come through peace. Um, I heard a, a, very, a very interesting idea once that, uh, from Rav Chaim Velozhna. Rav Chaim Velozhna lived about 180 years ago. He was the foremost student of the Vilna Gaon. And uh, he said like this, he says that uh, when you want to make peace, right, you've got two people that are going head to head, right? That you can see they're about to have a, an argument, they're about to have a little punch up, right? So he says, what's the first thing you've got to do? Right? Just get in between and push them away a little bit. 
right? Just push them apart. So they're not, you know, the, the further apart they are, the less chance there is that they're actually going to launch into each other. So he says that in order to make peace, the first thing you've got to do is draw back. So I say Shalom bin Moim, but before we say Shalom bin Moim, what do we do? We take three steps backwards. And that gives us a little bit, a little bit more of a vista, a little bit more of a view to be able to see what's really going on. You know, very often <clears throat> when we fall out with people, when we argue with people, we're arguing about something which very often is not terribly important, but we just we get caught up in the in the details of what it is that we're arguing about, and we just lose sight of what we're, you know, what what's important and what's not. And uh, the way to, you know, the way to sort of deal with something like that is to just, just step back a little bit, take a deep breath, you know, count to whatever it is, whatever you need. Some people need to count to 10. If you're an angry person, then you probably need to count to maybe 5,000 or something. But, you know, just to, just to sort of allow yourself to calm down a little bit and to be able to look at something with a little, a little less passion. He says, that's what we learn over here, that in order to make peace, the first thing you've got to do is step back. Oh, you say, Shalom bin Moim, take your three steps back, and then you can start talking about the concept of peace. <clears throat> What's interesting, yeah. Are we talking about peace on the previous paragraph? Yeah, yeah, which means that peace, <clears throat> to, the thing is like this, um, the, the, the whole of the Amidah, except for this final paragraph over here, is written in the plural. Right? And it's written, when we come to recite the Amidah, we're, we're reciting it, you know, we're really reciting it for the whole of the Jewish people. It's not, I'm not just reciting for myself, but I'm reciting for everybody. So, for example, example you know, easy examples over here, if you know any, any Hebrew, if you're familiar with Hebrew, right? So, Hashivenu Avinu, Slach Lanu, Rafa'enu, Borech Aleinu, right? All of this is written in the plural because we are praying for everybody. However, this last paragraph over here, which we discussed, you know, when, when we started the paragraph, is a paragraph which has been added on. It's written in the singular, right? And it's got a it's got a very personal dimension to it. That's one of the reasons why over here, before you get to the uh, that you know, penultimate verse, you can add in any any particular prayers that you've got, any particular requests that you have, right? Uh, whatever you want, however you want, you can put it in over here, and. Uh, so we're reiterating the idea of shalom is something which is so fundamental, it's something which is so important that we're putting it in not just inside of the regular meter, but it's appearing over here in this, you know, it's like a little bit of a PS over here. Right? So we've got the divine presence in front of us. The way that I described it at the beginning of all of this was that, uh, you know, if you have a, you're part of a delegation that comes in front of the president, right? And uh, at the end of your meeting, you've got, you've got like a two-minute audience, just you and him, right, where you can, you can ask for whatever you want. And that's really what this final paragraph over here is for. And because the concept of peace, shalom, is so fundamental, it's so basic, so what we do is that we, uh, we ask for it again. Um, again, just to, to re-emphasize, shalom is not peace in the, you know, it's, it, it doesn't sort of mean peace in the, in the way that we probably all imagine peace. Shalom is really a state of tranquility something far beyond peace, right? Which means that peace is just, you know, I, I really think over here in Israel, peace is just a cessation of war, which means that, uh, you know, you, you have cold peace and you have hot peace and, uh, I, I don't know, uh, like you have cold wars and you have hot wars as well, I guess. But uh, shalom is something which is a lot more all-encompassing than just peace. It's something, it's a state of being, right? Where it's not just that there's no war, it's not just that nobody's trying to attack, but it's an inner state of feeling tranquil and it's something which is you know we should we, we all aspire towards that's for sure whether we reach it or not that's going to be dependent on how much work we're going to put into it for ourselves and how much we're going to work in our relationship with other people as well to try to avoid running in having bust-ups with people um, <clears throat> and once we've once we've finished the Amida then then there's a little another little paragraph which is added in over here which is really focusing on rebuilding the temple. Now, again, you're going to ask the same question, but we davened for rebuilding the temple. We already did that in, inside of the Amidah itself. <clears throat> but over here we're saying, that HaKadosh Baruch should build the temple quickly in our day. It's interesting, we've come back into the plural over here. That he should give us a chilek in his Torah. That we're going to come back in the way that we did in the in the good old days. The uh, the 
So I once heard a beautiful idea. The the uh, the emphasis over here in this particular paragraph is on the on the words the tain chelkenu b'torah techo, right? About halfway through. What what is the what is the idea that we're saying over here? Everybody has their own chelek in the Torah. Everybody's got their own piece of the Torah, their own little portion. What does that mean? Everybody's got their own potential, right? Each person's unique and each person has a very unique relationship with God. And everybody's been put into this world for a specific reason. And what we're praying for over here is the ability to be able to take the Chalkeinu B'Torah Techel, that each person has access to a little piece of the Torah that belongs only to them. It doesn't belong to anybody else, right? And that's what we're davening for. We're davening that we should be able to reach our potential, right? What is your potential? I don't know. That's part of the problem of being down here in this imperfect physical world that we live in. <clears throat> you're, you're, you know, I, I think like this. I might be wrong. It has been known to happen. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think potential is like this I don't think the concept of potential for most people I don't think it makes any difference if you become a biologist or if you become a, a, uh, you know, a lawyer or if you become a garbage collector I don't, I don't think that you know, when a person gets up stage at the age of 120 and has to give an accounting for what they've done here in this physical world I don't think God is going to say to them listen, you know, you bozo, you, you, uh, you got a PhD in biology, but I, I really wanted you to be a lawyer. I, don't, I really don't think that that's, uh, that's going to happen at all, which means that what God wants is for us to reach our potential within the path that we've chosen. Right? Which means, so a person chooses to be a biologist, if you choose to become a, a, a uh, you know, medical, medical equipment distributor, if you choose to become a lawyer, whatever it is, right? You, you, uh, God, God now wants you to achieve your, your greatest potential with inside of the choices that you've made. <clears throat> there are exceptions to the rule. Right? An exception to the rule would be if somebody had the potential to become a great Torah leader and he chooses instead to go into some kind of a profession or to go into something else altogether, then I think God is probably going to have one or two words to say to the fellow when he gets up there at the age of 120. But I think that under normal circumstances, that's not the case. Why am I saying that? Because it's a very, there's a very famous story told. There was back in a place called Velozhin, one, uh, one of the great Rosh Hashimahs of Velozhin was somebody called Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. He was known by the acronym of the letters of, the, of his name. He was called the Nitziv. And he was the Rosh Hashiva of Velozhin. And he was very prolific. He wrote very, very deep Sfarim. He wrote, he wrote a commentary on the Torah. He wrote a commentary on some, you know, on, on, on rather obs obscure works. And uh, he wrote hundreds, if not thousands, of responses to people who asked him questions. And he once, he wrote a, he wrote a series of books called the Sheiltot, <laughs> which are, again, that it's, it's somewhat esoteric, it's, it's somewhat obscure. <clears throat> and uh, when he finished it, and, he, and these were published, he made what suda, su, it's called a sudat hoda'a, a meal of thanksgiving. Right? And at the meal, he invited his students, and at the meal, he got up and he told the following story. He said that when he was six or seven years old, he was a, you know, like a little six, seven-year-old kid. He wasn't, wasn't a, you know, he wasn't born... As a, a righteous, you know, some kind of righteous, pious baby who made brochas over his mother's milk and knew the whole of Shas before he could speak. Um, he was a kid. And uh, he said once he came home and he heard his parents talking in the kitchen. And as he got closer, he heard his father was crying and talking to his mother and telling his mother that he doesn't know how to get little Naftali, how to get him to be serious about his Torah learning. And... Uh, you know, he doesn't know what to do with him. And uh, this little kid, he was so shaken up by the depth of his father's sorrow that he, that he went into the kitchen and he promised his parents that from now on he was going to take his Torah studies very seriously. And from there he grew and he grew and he became the, one, of the, one of the most important Torah leaders in Eastern Europe in the generation that he lived in. And he said over there in this, in this, uh, this meal that he gave, he, talk, he said over there like this. He said, if I hadn't have heard my parents speaking about me, he said, I wouldn't have changed. If I hadn't have changed, then my parents at some point, they would have apprenticed me out to the local shoemaker. 
and I would have become a shoemaker in time. I would have become a shoemaker. He said, I would have been very, very honest. I would have been very, I would have been very pious. I would have stitched every shoe, would have been done, you know, L'Shem Shemayim. And I would have, after I finished work every day, I would have gone to the base of Medrash, to the, to the study hall. And I would have, uh, I would have learned, you know, a little bit of Mishnah and maybe a little bit of Ein Yaakov. And I would have been a, a good, a good upstanding Jew, right? And I would get upstairs at the age of 120 and I would say to God, okay, where's my reward? And God will say to me, what do you mean, where's your reward? Where was the Rosh Hashiva of Velazhin? Where was the person who was supposed to write the fantastic commentary on the Chumash and the fantastic commentary on the Sheiltot and to write all those thousands of responses to all those people that were writing questions into you? What do you mean, where's your reward? You blew it. So he said that the, Suda, the Sudat Hoda'ah, this meal of thanksgiving, it was, he wasn't giving thanks to the fact that he'd managed to publish this book, but he was giving thanks to the fact that he heard his parents talking about him, and that changed his whole approach to who he was, who, who he was going to be. <coughs> so I tell you, for years, for years I was bothered by this, because you know what, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty terrifying story, I think. It means that a person can do everything right his entire life and get upstairs and find out that he's done it wrong. That's pretty scary, isn't it? You he could You don't think Hashem would, would guide you into the correct path? Yeah, so obviously over here that's what happened, right? right. But it still, it still requires his free choice to hear, right? Which means that he could have heard his parents and just carried on doing what he was doing because oh, he's only a seven-year-old kid, right? You know, how, how, uh, how responsible are seven-year-old children? <clears throat> so it's true that for sure HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to send you, I'm sure, messages on the way Little, little sort of like pointers on the way to say, maybe, maybe you shouldn't be doing this, maybe you should be doing something else instead. The question is whether we're going to listen to them. And that means, like I said, a person can spend his entire life, uh, we're not talking about somebody who goes off and becomes a, you know, becomes a, becomes a robber and, and uh, you know, ends up uh, doing all kinds of terrible things. We're talking about somebody who's an upstanding member of the Jewish community and he's nice and from, he's very orthodox and he's doing everything he's supposed to do. But God says to him, no, 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 you weren't supposed to do that. You were supposed to do something else altogether. So, like I said, that's pretty terrifying, no? Because, I mean, so how, how do you know? How do you know if you're doing what you're supposed to do? So I really, I think the answer is that with the, only with very few exceptions, if you're supposed to be a Natsiv, if you're supposed to be a Natali Tzvi Yudah Berlin, then you've got a, you've got a, you know, you've got an obligation to the Jewish nation to become who you need to become. But for everybody else, I don't think that this concept of potential is talking about what profession you're supposed to be in. I don't think it's talking about, you know, I, th I think it's talking about now that you've chosen what you want to do, now that you've chosen where you're going to live, now that you've chosen which community you're going to belong to, uh, you've got to live up to that, right? You've got to become the best you possibly can inside of that. But I think there's another thing over here as well, which I think is something very fundamental, I think it's something very beautiful as well. But Tein Chalkeinu Betoratecha means every single person has their own unique dimension of who they're supposed to be. Right? Your neshama, your soul is unique, and your relationship with God is supposed to be unique. And therefore, I think what we're learning over here is that to copy somebody else's relationship with God, maybe that's not going to get you very far. Because God doesn't need two of those people, right? He needs one of them and one of you. Which means that a person's got to forge his own you know, it's called Avodat Hashem, right? He's got to forge his own way in worshipping God, in, again, with inside of what he's supposed to do, right? There are, there are rules, <clears throat> right? With inside the rules of Judaism, you've got to become the most innovative person that you can be that's going to reflect your individuality, right? Inside of the rules, right? Inside of the laws. And that's really what we're saying at the end of all of this, after we've recited, spent all this time reciting the Amidah and and uh, connecting together with God, we end off recognizing and acknowledging that I have to do what I need to do in order to be able to, to in order to be able to, to fulfill what it is that God wants me here for. Has anybody here got a birthday coming up? He just passed. He just passed. Okay. When? Last week. Last week. When was yours? June fifth. Okay, not bad. When's that? That was also last week, right? Okay, so listen, because 
you know, nobody else seems to have a birthday coming up. So we're going to have to we're going to have to rely on you that you've just had yours. Rabbi Nachman Mibrestev says a very beautiful thing about birthdays. He says a birthday is a time to celebrate the fact that God wants you down here in this world. Right, you and you and every single person. You know, you have your birthday. What what, what are you celebrating? You're not just celebrating another year's gone by, but you're celebrating the fact God God needs you here. He wants you over here, right? And if he wants you over here and he needs you over here, that, that truly is something to celebrate. So the truth of the matter is that we could celebrate every day, right? But I imagine going out every day and celebrating, you know, is uh, maybe, maybe that's a little bit difficult. But at least what, what we should do is that we should take the one day in the year and we should be thankful and happy that this is what God, God wants us here. And that's why I'm here. And therefore, I, have, I really do have what to celebrate. I... Uh... When I was 20 years old, I kind of decided that my birthday wasn't for me. You passed, was, you passed 20 already? Yeah, I did. I know. I <laughs> nah. I hit, I hit PWU, you know, a little early. <laughs> um, and my birthday wasn't for me. It was for everyone else. Because why would you care that it was my birthday? It was my day to show you why you should appreciate me being here. Oh, birthday. wow. That's very altruistic of you. Most people are the other way around. <laughs> Birthdays are, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. Do you know, there's a, I've never, I don't know where, the, I, I've, I've never seen a source for this, but there is a concept that seems to be very much accepted in the Jewish world, that on your birthday, you can give out brachot to people, bless people, right? Because it's an auspicious day, like it's your day, right? So you can use your day to give out blessings to people. I don't know. I don't know a source for this. I really don't. But it, it's a it's a it's a very beautiful idea. It really is. Where I'm from, you just get drunk for free for a whole week. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's the whole week. And know. that's why you have 52 birthdays a year, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say that for most for most people, I don't know about getting drunk bit, but having for the for free, right? I mean, for most people, that's what birthdays are all about, right? You know, the, the, you know, here it's my birthday. Come and come and help me celebrate by buying me things. That, that's that's like the general the general approach to birthdays. Yeah. 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 But all the Lashem Minchas Yehuda Yerushalayim that we should bring we should bring the Mincha offering to Yerushalayim, right? Yeah, for sure. It's it's a it's a again. What Mincha Yehuda? Huh? Mincha Yehuda Yerushalayim. Where does Yehuda come into all of this? I, I need to look it up. I keep telling him not to ask me questions I don't know the answers to, but uh, <laughs> he, never, he never listens. It's terrible. It's not just terrible. And what kind of offering are they speaking about there? <clears throat> In, in general, over here, yeah, in the, in the, 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 mincha, the mincha offering in general is normally a meal offering, right? Even though, even though it corresponds to the, you know, the mincha, mincha just means the afternoon. There were all different kinds, all different kinds of sacrifices that were brought. Some of them were animal, animal sacrifices, some of them were meal offerings, right? Meal offerings were normally made up from flour and oil, um, and they were mixed together, and there were different ways that they were offered, depending on what kind of offering you were bringing, it depends on how it was prepared. So sometimes it was baked and sometimes it was fried, um, and it normally it normally it no, it normally has. <coughs> maybe that was a mincha offering once. I don't know. <laughs> come come back as a. Uh, um, but at, um, and it was it was uh, it was it was normally made with a lot of olive oil, right, and and very very fine flour. There was one exception, which was something called the sota offering, which I don't want to go into. But that's a a woman who's done something she shouldn't have done. Um, but the the uh, it was made from very fine flour and olive oil, and like I said, it was either fried or it was baked, um, and then it was given to the Kohanim to eat. Is there anybody here a Kohen? No, I want a Kohen. Okay, whatever. I mean, being a Kohen was a for, uh, for the poor person. Some sometimes, right? Which means like this: sometimes when a person wasn't wasn't able to bring an animal offering because he was too poor, so he would bring a uh, he would bring a mincha offering instead. He would bring a meal offering instead, um, and that was considered. It's interesting. The eyes of God, it was considered to be something very, 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 very precious. 
There's a, the, one, of, one of the classic Hasidic commentaries, a Svat Emet, one of the second gear Rebbe. So he says that uh, he says that when you make a when you make a, a calculation in ratio, it's entirely conceivable that this mincha offering that's being brought, this meal offering that's being brought by the poor person, is 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 more. It's worth more than an animal offering that's being bought by a rich person. Right, because the animal offering for the rich person, so fine, you know, he's got plenty of money, he's just going to, whatever, big, big deal, right? Uh, whereas the person who, who's a poor person who's bringing the meal offering, get, having, you know, bringing it in ratio to what he owns and what he's got, it's, a, it's considered to be a very significant offering that he's bringing. And he, say, he explains that's why the offerings of the poor people, as a rule, were very much precious in the eyes of God. They gave a reach nichach l'Hashem. They gave a very pleasant, pleasant aroma to God. They had a special dimension to them. Uh, it's interesting. For example, um, certain offerings. So if you couldn't bring an animal offering, you could bring a bird offering instead. Bird offerings, of course, were much cheaper than animals. Birds, you know, birds are you know, turtle doves and doves weren't. They didn't cost very much at all, and uh, they were offered up with their feathers. Now, I don't know if you know anything about, uh, you know. Burning feathers, but burning feathers have the most terrible smell to them. Really? And uh, in the Beis Hamidosh, there was no terrible smell. Quite the opposite. It says again, it uses that phrase, it was a reach michach, it brought a, a beautiful smell to God. And the reason, explains the Gemara, the reason is that because the, the bird was offered up with its feathers to make it look bigger than it was. If you take a bird and you pluck it, so very often it can lose, maybe even a third of its bulk will be lost. And this little bird is going to be even smaller. And it could be, you know, it's like embarrassing. You know, you're bringing, you're bringing this tiny little thing. Here, this is my offering. And the guy next to you, he's bringing this, a great big bull, right? And, and you've got this tiny little bird over here. And uh, so God says, no, I want you to bring it with the feathers. I want it to be as big as, as, big as it can be, right? <clears throat> that at least you should feel that you're bringing something significant. And it says that one of the, one of the miracles that took place inside of the temple was that even though the bird's feathers were burning on the Mizbeach, on the, on the altar, nevertheless, they didn't give off a terrible smell, but rather the smell was, it was a very beautiful smell to God. Okay, after we finish the Amida, so the Amida is like this. When you're dominating with a minion, after you finish the Amida, so normally there'll be a repetition of the Amida. So then you just go through the whole thing all over again, and then we spoke about this as we went through it. You have to say Kedusha, and then you have to say Modi Manach Murov together with everybody, and you should answer Amen to all of the Brachot. Uh, and then when you get to the end of the Amida, now, what, what's going to be? <clears throat> there, is, there is something called Tachanun. What is Tachanun? Tachanun is a prayer which is recited where we bemoan the fact that we don't have a temple, right? Prayer that we have today is taking the place of what was supposed to happen inside of the temple. Which means that this is not a this is not an optimum. The way that we're praying today is not an optimum. Rather, we would like the temple to be rebuilt, and that way we can go back to the temple service and being there in the temple rather than going through the motions of davening in the way that we do. So inside of prayer, we under normal circumstances during the year, every day, except for Shabbos, we remember the fact that we don't have a temple. And we dumb. We pray that the temple should be rebuilt. Now, depending on which kind of community you pray with, is going to depend on what they're going to say over here. <clears throat> so, for example, if you take a look on page 119a, something called vidui. If you dab and if you pray with a Sfadi community or with a Hasidic community, then they're going to recite the vidui every time that they recite Tachnun, they're going to recite the Vidui as well. Now the Vidui involves a little bit of chest beating, Ashamnu, Bagadnu, Gazalnu, right? Mm -hmm. And then at the end of it, we, we say Hashem, Hashem, Kerachum, Bechanun. These are very, very lofty ideas, they're very beautiful ideas, our connection with God. If you pray with an Ashkenazi minion, they won't say this. Right? Just so you should know that whatever is going on in the community that you're praying in, it's okay, right? <clears throat> Don't, don't start shouting, if you're an Ashkenazi minion, don't start shouting, hey, you know, 119A, what's going on over here? What have you done with it? Um, it's just, it's not, it's not said. If it's, if it's a day of the week where there's no Kriyata Torah, so there's Mondays and Thursdays, not, it's not Monday and it's not Thursday, 
So then you go straight onto page 132 to, cool, to what's called Nefilat Apim, that you put your head down, right? So you're supposed to put your head, your, your forehead down onto your forearm, and you recite the first paragraph over here on page 132, and then, <clears throat> again, it's going to get a little bit complicated because on a regular day, you just jump through to page 136, and you sit upright, and when you get to the bottom, the last paragraph, Anachnu lo neida, then you stand up. What do you do if it's a Monday or a Thursday? On Monday and Thursday, the prayers are much longer, which means that you start at the beginning over here. Again, if it's Nusach Ashkenazi, you don't mean Ashkenazi, minion, you start on page 124, and you just got to work your way through. Lots, lots of it, 126, 128, 130, 132, and then you get to Vayomer David El Gad, which is the regular Tachman that's recited every day, and then you, that's what you do, you put your head down over here, and then you say everything on page 134, and on page 136, it, ta it takes much longer, right? If you're davening with a, Ash with a Hasidic or a Svadic minion, so then it's all going to be preceded with the vidui, with the Hashem, Hashem, Karachum, Vachanun, right? Again, whatever, whatever happens, it's fine. Whatever they do, it's fine. Um, everything, er, anything goes. We're very pluralistic, right? Yeah, they don't put their head down, do they? I mean, they don't cover their head. This is party. They, 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 I they mean, they, they sit down. I know they sit down and read. Ah, that's, really? That's what, they, that's what they told me. I mean, I dove in Sephardi. Yeah, yeah. Yes, some thought you yes, some thought you no. Know. Oh, right. Okay, so here you go. Whatever you do, okay. <laughs> it's gonna be okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was supposed to cover my head. They just oh yeah. Like that. so okay, that's interesting. Me. I've never, I've never heard that. Yeah, you're familiar with that. In my sidu is, uh, it's writing, but my rabbi say no, not to do. Interesting. Okay. And then when we get when when you get now, if you, if you're praying by yourself, and if you're praying by yourself. Vidu, vidu, you say when you pray by yourself also? Yeah. Everything, yeah. the whole of it, yeah? Okay, so if you pray by yourself, the whole of Tachman is recited as regular. Again, if, you, if your custom is to recite the vidu, which is this thing on page 119a, and 100, right? So if, if it's your custom to say, you should say that as well, even if you're not praying with a minion, right? And everything else should be recited as well. When you're praying with a minion, when you get to when you get to the end of the Amidah, when you get to the end of Tachnun, at that point, Kaddish, half Kaddish is going to be recited. Right? Now, half Kaddish is there just to let us know that we've reached the end of one portion and we're going to be moving on into the next portion. Okay, half Kaddish is on top of page 138 over here. In case anybody wants to have a look, if you don't believe me, There it is. Okay, we're, we're going to stop over here in Mitzvah Hashem. And tomorrow, Mitzvah Hashem, we've got to talk about, we've got to talk about Kriyat Torah. And if there is, if there isn't, what's going to happen? Mitzvah Hashem, we'll get there.